I'm Kevin Esfeldt. I'm an assistant professor at the MIT Media Lab, where I lead the Sculpting Evolution Group. This is my second iBiology talk on gene drive and other technologies for engineering ecosystems. Now, gene drive is a naturally occurring phenomenon that happens when a vertically transmitted genetic element, that is something that's passed on from parents to offspring, will reliably spread in a population even if it doesn't help individual organisms reproduce. Now, gene drives are ubiquitous in nature, and they operate by many, many different mechanisms. But they all tend to require sexual reproduction, or at least some form of sharing genetic information. The rate at which they spread depends on the generation time of the organism, and also on the rate of gene flow between populations. And different kinds of gene drive can either alter, and some of them can also suppress populations to lower levels. But when we're talking about different kinds of drive systems, it's usually useful to think about them spatially. That is, what happens if you release a particular number of organisms into a local population of the target species? How will that drive system then spread? Will it spread into neighboring populations connected by low levels of gene flow? And will it spread through successive populations. So we can think of it as releasing a number of organisms at a particular site of release, and then observing how the drive system is predicted to spread through the rest of the population. So let's start with what we think of as a standard gene drive, and this is what we call a self-propagating drive. Now, as the image indicates, you release a number of these organisms, and a standard gene drive is predicted to alter all of the populations. And the reason is that whereas a normal gene has a 50% chance of being passed on to offspring, assuming a heterozygote parent, a standard gene drive has up to 100% of being inherited. And the reason is that it cuts the wild type equivalent gene in the reproductive cells and copies itself over, thereby ensuring that up to 100% of gametes carry the gene drive system. And this means that by copying itself in the reproductive cells of every generation, it can spread through subsequent generations of organisms, eventually affecting an entire population. Mechanistically, we can build these using CRISPR as our genome editing tool of choice. To make them stable, we typically want to identify an important gene, that is, something that is important for the fitness of the organism. And we then build a recoded version of that important gene, wherein we change the codon usage to remove target sites for CRISPR. We then encode guide RNAs targeting the original sites and a CRISPR nuclease and whatever gene we want to spread through the population. Then in the reproductive cells of heterozygotes that have one copy of each, CRISPR components will be produced. They will cut the important gene at many different sites, causing this double strand break. The cell will then repair the damage either by homology-directed repair, in which case the drive system is copied, so now there are two copies and it is guaranteed inheritance, or it will jam the ends together of the broken DNA. And if this happens, then it will delete this important section of the gene. And that means that the result will be more costly evolutionarily than the drive system itself. In other words, using this design, natural selection will favor the drive system, meaning that it should not be blocked by resistant alleles that cannot be cut. And several models and more recently experiments have supported this, the effectiveness of this design. So what needs to be done next to continue to develop standard gene drives? Well, several steps need to be optimized in each organism for a given application. And those include learning how to express the nuclease at a time that maximizes the frequency of homology-directed repair. We also need to ensure that cutting does not take place in the embryo, because homology-directed repair is typically lower, and population suppression will not work if cutting happens in the embryo. Finally, we need to continue to develop alternative CRISPR editing systems, such as Cas12a, that allow us to target multiple sites in regions important for fitness without introducing repetitive DNA sequences throughout the drive system itself. And that's important for stability. So self-propagating standard gene drive systems have a number of benefits. They're powerful and efficient, 
And that is likely to be required for the most important application, which is the potential eradication of malaria in Africa. But they also have a number of downsides that rule them out for the vast majority of other applications. Specifically, they're predicted to be highly invasive. And that means it, it's likely to be very difficult to run confined field trials, if possible at all. The reason is that standard gene drive systems are capable of copying themselves indefinitely. And a drive system that is copied very efficiently, that has a high homing efficiency, as we call it, a copying efficiency, is predicted to spread between two populations and invade a second population if one in a million organisms moves between the two populations. We can't say for sure whether the same is true of suppression drives, because no models have been done specifically of population suppression drives. It's possible that in some species, the drive system will self-extinguish in a local population before it can spread to a new one. But if you compare models of different systems, if you compare an alteration drive system that is not designed to be stable, and so will eventually be outcompeted by resistant alleles, it never rises above 40% of the population then this very same system is predicted to be highly invasive. And that's because there are a number of organisms here that are carriers that can move between populations. And if you look at the number of carriers of this alteration drive that gets outcompeted over time, we know that the models say that this is highly invasive. And if we look at a different model of a suppression drive by Austin Bird and co-workers, then this predicts a number of carriers of this suppression drive that are present before the population crashes that is not much less than the highly invasive alteration drive. So we don't know for sure. Additional modeling needs to be done. But our default expectation is that all self-propagating standard gene drives are likely to move very efficiently between populations. And that's going to be a challenge. We also need to be aware that we can't simply assume that we will be able to develop these drive systems in our laboratories and even attempt field trials without outside interference. And just a look at history shows that this is likely to be the case. Australia was interested in using rabbit hemorrhagic fever to control populations of invasive rabbits in Australia. And it escaped from the test island and was carried unexpectedly by blowflies to the mainland, where it began to spread across the continent. This caused New Zealand to decide that they did not want it to be introduced, and in fact made it illegal. But New Zealand farmers decided to smuggle it in anyway, through the tightest biocontrol in the world. And they did this even though the total economic damage caused by rabbits in New Zealand is only somewhere between seven and $30 million a year. In contrast, rats, which are a major proposed conservation target for suppression gene drive systems, cause over $20 billion a year, billion, not million, in the United States alone, in terms of economic damages. So to imagine that people would not move a suppression gene drive for economic reasons should not even be considered. It will happen. That is how the world works. And we can't just assume that things will happen the way our models predict. Put all this together, and that means that we should probably reserve standard self-propagating gene drive for problems that require us to affect an entire species and for which an international agreement among the affected countries is likely to be feasible. And the number one such application is indeed the eradication of malaria. Malaria is such an awful disease. It inflicts such a terrible toll. More than half a million people annually, 200 million infections. Most of those who die are children under the age of five. This is a problem that is so severe that it's possible to imagine an international agreement among countries of the African Union to use it even without field trials. And if they do, then the same technology could be used, potentially, to eradicate other scourges, such as schistosomiasis. But we have to keep in mind that a single tragic death in an ill-planned clinical trial set the field of gene therapy back by a full decade. And any accident involving gene drive that prevented the countries of the African Union from deciding to use it to prevent malaria, if that set back the effort by just a decade, the expected cost would be 3 million lives, at least. <laughs>
So everyone working with gene drive needs to be aware that lives are literally hanging in the balance. So when we are developing our safety pr protocols and taking precautions and even deciding, should we be running these experiments in the first place? That is what is at stake. Instead, most laboratories may want to pursue alternative drive systems that are not self-propagating. The opposite of a self-propagating drive system is one that is self-exhausting. That is, it's one that relies on some form of genetic fuel that is used up over generations as the drive spreads until eventually it runs out and stops. This means that you get a spreading pattern in which the release of a few organisms leads to some amplification before it eventually stops. You release more organisms, it spreads further through the population. But it does not spread indefinitely through all connected populations. How do you build such a self-exhausting drive system? Well, my group is developing what we call daisy drives, which separates the components of the drive system across multiple chromosomes in ways that are linked. So if you assume that a given daisy drive has three elements, C and B and A, then C has the instructions that cause B to be copied. So C tells CRISPR to cut the wild type equivalent of B and copy it over. B has the instructions causing A to be copied. But there is nothing causing C to be copied. C is a normal engineered gene. And that means that when we look at the family tree of something like a daisy drive, if we assume that the drive carrier at the top is a heterozygote, it has one copy each of C and B and A, then when that organism mates with a wild type, then all of the offspring will inherit B and A. But this one on the end here does not inherit C. And in the next generation, that means you get an offspring that does not inherit B. So this one only carries A, which means one more generation of mating to wild type, and you finally get a descendant of that original CBA organism that is entirely wild type. So here's an example of how the drive system literally runs out of genetic fuel, it runs out of daisy elements, and stops. Of course, this implies that the more daisy elements you have in the chain, then the more powerful the drive system, the greater the frequency it will reach in the population for a given release of organisms. How many is that? Well, it depends on how efficient the copying is. So daisy drives work by the same CRISPR-based copying mechanism. So if the copying rate is 90% and you want to alter most organisms in a population within 20 generations, then you would need to release one daisy drive organism per 50 wild organisms in that population. And 20 generations later, they would all be affected. But if your copying efficiency is 98%, as has been seen in some malarial mosquitoes, then you only need to release one daisy drive organism per 500 wild ones. So this is very efficient. The problem for daisy drive, and indeed for all of these, is that of gene flow. So let's assume that we have a number of interconnected populations, and we're going to introduce a drive system into one, and it's going to spread through other populations. And each of these is connected by a comparatively low level of gene flow. Let's look at what happens in the frequency of the different engineered DNA elements over time. For the daisy drive, you introduce it into the first population at a high enough frequency. It will rise to very high frequency, and then it will eventually, after a couple hundred generations, it will go down to zero. That's in population one. But in connected population two, it also reaches a reasonably high frequency before going back down. And there's a little bit that makes it into three, and basically none into four and five. We can contrast that with a standard gene drive that is self-propagating. And here, once released in population one, it spreads to virtually all organisms. And of course, it spreads into all of the other populations, one through five. The other useful comparator on the other end is what happens if we simply release a lot of engineered organisms with no drive system at all, that are just engineered to have the relevant trait. If we release enough of them, what's called an inundative release, such that the frequency of organisms that have the engineered trait is nearly all of them, nearly one, then we still see a little bit of change in population two, but virtually none in three and four and five. The problem is, for many applications, given the sensitivity of genome editing and public views of it, 
even this little bit of spread of a normal engineered element may not be acceptable. That is, we can't necessarily afford to have any significant gene flow across political boundaries. Ideally, we need to be able to engineer a population within the boundaries of a particular town and somehow eliminate engineered DNA everywhere else. How can we do that? Well, one option is to turn to a third kind of drive system that is also local, which we call a threshold drive. And it's called a threshold drive because it is frequency dependent. That is, whether or not the drive system spreads or is actively eliminated depends on its frequency in the population. If you introduce few of them, then natural selection will eliminate them all. If you introduce many, then it will spread to become very common, nearly fixed, within the one population, but it will not be able to spread effectively into the next, because in that population it will be in the minority. How do you do that? Well, in 1968, Curtis proposed that chromosomal translocations could be used to generate this kind of effect. If you take two wild-type chromosomes and you transpose two arms, that is, you just break off one arm from each chromosome and you swap them, then this organism has two copies of all genes. It's fine. But when it mates with a wild-type organism, or indeed any organism, then the offspring will sometimes inherit a wild-type chromosome and sometimes a chromosome that has a translocation. If they inherit two wild-type, they're fine. If they inherit two with a translocation, then they're balanced. They still have all the relevant genes. In both cases, they're just like one or the other parent. But the other two possibilities involve inheriting one translocated chromosome and one wild-type chromosome. And in this case, they're missing critical DNA. And that means they're eliminated. So this phenomenon is called genetic underdominance. And what it means is that when hybrids, when heterozygote organisms, are unfit relative to either homozygous version, then whichever allele, either in this case engineered or wild type, is in the majority, will win, assuming they're otherwise equivalent in fitness. And this has actually been experimentally demonstrated by Bruce Hayes' group at Caltech in fruit flies. They used CRISPR to generate chromosomal translocations and introduced flies that had these translocations into cages containing wild type flies. And they did the introduction at different frequencies. And they found that if introduced at above 60% frequency into, into this population of wild flies, then the translocated engineered version would take over. It would go to 100%. But if it was introduced at any frequency less than 60%, then it would go down to zero. So here's an actual working example of a threshold-based drive system. Other examples have also been demonstrated using toxin antitoxin systems, but those are a little bit more complicated and are, have not been shown to be stable over time. Whereas we know from naturally occurring translocations that this version is very stable. So these threshold drives are extremely compelling precisely because they're so localized. They, if introduced in an area, they will stay within that area because they will be actively eliminated elsewhere. The problem is that they can't be used to directly suppress populations. They can only alter them. Now it's true that they can spread alterations that could then be targeted by another kind of drive, say using CRISPR, but that would still be extra steps. Perhaps the bigger problem is that releasing sufficient organisms to reach a 60% frequency requires releasing more engineered organisms than normally exist in the wild in that area. And for species that are actively causing a problem, whether because they're environmentally destructive or they're pests, that may just not be feasible. So one potential solution is to combine a self-exhausting drive with a threshold drive. So my group is working on building what we call daisy threshold systems. Now, a daisy system cannot spread a chromosomal translocation. So instead, we're looking at creating a different form of threshold drive in which we deliberately swap two haploinsufficient genes. Now, haploinsufficient just means that you need two copies in order to live. If you have one copy, that's just not enough. So if you take two haploinsufficient genes and you swap their positions, just the genes, not the whole chromosome arms, then you get the same effect. When mated with a wild-type organism, offspring can either inherit two swapped copies, 
and they'll be fine just like their heterozygote parent. Or two wild copies, in which case they'll be wild type just like their wild parent. But the other two possibilities are inheriting one swapped and one wild type. And these organisms are missing a critical haploinsufficient gene, and so they, they will perish. So the net effect is to create a threshold system that can be spread using a daisy. So here, the idea is you introduce into a given population of a town that wants to alter its local organisms, daisy threshold organisms in the center of town. The daisy drive spreads the alterations through the town towards the boundary, losing genetic fuel as it goes. And only when it runs out does the threshold switch on, because while a daisy element is present, all of the offspring are guaranteed to inherit two swapped copies. As soon as you run out of daisy elements, as soon as daisy elements are gone, then you get the threshold effect. So when the daisy elements run out, say, towards the edge of the town boundary, then within the town, the threshold will have been exceeded, and it will actively select for the engineered variant. But in the neighboring town, the engineered allele will be in the minority, and natural selection will actively eliminate it. So this will allow very few organisms, comparatively few, to be released in a town while still keeping the alterations within that town and not allowing it to spread across the boundary. So overall, we have two broadly different forms of drive system. We have standard gene drive systems that are self-propagating and are really only suited for applications where the goal is to affect most or all of a species. On the other hand, we have these local drives that have many, many more potential beneficial applications, from health to the environment, animal well-being, and eventually even agriculture, that would allow us to make very small changes that could solve severe ecological problems in the most minimalist way possible. Because whenever we're thinking about engineering a complex system that we don't completely understand, which applies to any biological system, but especially to, e to wild ecosystems, we should always strive to make the smallest possible change capable of solving the problem, and we should start small and see what happens before scaling up. And that latter test, the ability to run a field trial, requires that we have some form of localization that prevents the alteration from spreading indefinitely beyond the trial site and into the world beyond. However, all forms of drive system face extra safety and regulatory barriers that just don't apply to normal engineered DNA. And the reason is that we, humanity, we have never before engineered something anticipated to evolve outside of our control. Normal engineered organisms only reproduce when deliberately crossed, or at least within environments in which we do control the relevant environmental factors. With a gene drive system, or any drive system, that is just no longer the case. Will a drive system spreading through a wild population that we cannot directly impact, will it evolve to cut the equivalent sequence in a closely related species, say, that can form fertile hybrids with the target organism? That question is going to depend on what is the nature of the CRISPR-based drive, which guide RNAs are used, how different are the two sequences. That's an empirical question, and it's one that is going to need an answer. Will a drive system spread through the local population as anticipated? Is it going to spread further? Is it not going to spread as much? Will it be stable? Will it indeed stay local? How can we know for sure? The problem is that these are evolutionary questions, and evolution is a numbers game. There will always be more organisms present in the wild than we can possibly rear in the lab. And that is a serious problem. My group is attempting to develop a system capable of answering these questions using nematode worms, which reproduce every three days and can be grown in populations of billions. For example, if we're interested in determining whether a daisy drive system is in fact stable and localized, then we can introduce a handful of daisy drive worms into a large population and observe as the drive spreads over time using a fluorescence marker. But we wouldn't expect that marker to show up in all of the worms because this is supposed to be a daisy drive. It's supposed to run out of genetic fuel and stop. If it does spread to all the worms, we'll know that something went wrong and that drive system is not safe enough to use in a wild population. Similarly, if we're worried about 
any kind of CRISPR-based drive evolving to spread into a closely related species that might hybridize, we could build worms that have the target sequence in the desired organism. We could build separate worms that have the target sequence of a related species that we don't want it to spread into, that should have several mutations that are different. And then we could introduce worms carrying the drive system into that mixed population. Ideally, it would spread only through the worms carrying the target sequence. But if it ever spread into the related sequence, we would see because the fluorescent marker corresponding to the related sequence would disappear. And if that ever happens, even once, then it would spread through all the related species and we should definitely see it. So this is a way of quantifying the relative risk that any kind of drive system becomes unstable and starts to spread in a way that we don't want. Overall, though, it's very important to emphasize that the social barriers in the place of applications of ecological engineering are much greater than the technical challenges. That is, it's possible that technical advances could help address the social barriers. For example, better localization strategies is exactly that. But we should never operate under the illusion that the technical barriers are the greatest challenge. They're not. It's more important that we develop this in ways that are cognizant of those social barriers than focusing only on the technical challenges of making something work in a given organism. So my group is pursuing several different ways of addressing these problems. Number one is to communicate the concept in an understandable manner to very diverse populations. For example, with daisy drive, we're working to build mice in which every daisy element corresponds to a different coat color marker. We're then going to breed a family of mice in which you can see the grandparents, the parents, the kids, and then eventually the kids grow up and reproduce on their own. And you'll be able to see the genetics in the coat color of each of these mice. And of course, everyone will have their name and their own backstory in order to make a compelling story about this particular family of mice. Another problem is to ensure that applications are popularly supported and directed by communities. The Mice Against Ticks project doesn't involve any form of drive at all by community request. And the communities in this case are in charge. The people of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard have been directing this project from inception. They chose among several options and decided that they did not wish to use any kind of drive system, specifically because they preferred that the project not use any DNA foreign to white-footed mice. And this is a project that aims to address a very important local problem, the spread of tick-borne disease, including Lyme disease. And it intends to address it in a novel way by immunizing heritably the mice responsible for infecting most ticks. If successful on the islands where inundative release can be used, then it's possible that the same approach might be extended to the mainland using something like a daisy threshold system. But by starting small in an island context without any form of drive system at all, we can ensure that everything works well, initially on mostly uninhabited islands that are small enough that we could actually remove all of the mice and reintroduce them, and only scale up as appropriate once we're sure that things are working well at the previous stage. Lastly, those decisions will not be made by us, but by the communities who are interested, thereby ensuring that the project does actually address any and all community concerns, and does so at the earliest possible stage. Inviting community concerns is absolutely critical when it comes to developing eco-technologies intended to affect the shared environment, because decisions that we make as scientists early on are very likely to affect the outcome of any given application, including whether or not it goes forwards. So we need to be aware that if we do or say something that reduces the likelihood that the African Union can agree to use gene drive to help eradicate malaria, a 1% chance of a decade-long delay has an expected cost of 25,000 children's lives. What are our responsibilities to those people? What are our responsibilities to 
wild organisms that might be aided, whether endangered species that might be saved from invasive species that spread using human transport. What of organisms that are suffering that might be aided by our intervention? Are we responsible for them? What are our responsibilities to the natural world? We as scientists must be cognizant of the fact that the very notion of engineering wild species is deeply disturbing to many of our fellow citizens. And even if we don't share those values, we need to respect that because it's their world too. In order to respect the beliefs of people who oppose engineering the shared environment, and also to reduce the potential social backlash should a gene drive ever spread without community support. My group is, de is developing ways of restoring populations to their original wild genetics. That is, we hope to remove all engineered DNA elements from a population, no matter how they got there. And that includes standard self-propagating gene drives. If such a drive system were to be introduced without permission, then we might build a daisy restoration drive to counter it and overwrite it. So the daisy restoration drive would be introduced into the population that was affected by the unwanted drive system. It would then spread and overwrite it and replacing it with itself. It would also spread through the wild organisms near the boundary, thereby ensuring that every last copy is overwritten. But all of these daisy restoration elements are linked to a threshold effect, such that introducing additional wild organisms would then ensure that the engineered DNA is below the threshold frequency and will therefore be eliminated by natural selection. In fact, every last copy. It's our hope that by developing these technologies in the open, focusing on local communities, inviting input, concerns, and criticism, including from skeptics and people whose values oppose the very idea of engineering the shared environment, we hoped to come up with a, not a consensus, but still a path forwards that will allow us to fulfill our moral responsibilities, not only to one another, but also to the organisms with which we share our world.